I just have to say that. Yay! Um, I came from Minnesota yesterday. Um, yes, there's still a foot of snow on the ground. So I thought I could acknowledge this joyfully. We are in Costa Rica. Um, this is the title of the talk I, um, I came up with. Kyle asked me to speak about um, science in Costa Rica, OTS, the past, present, and future of tropical biology, and he asked me to do this in 25 minutes. Or less. O or less. <laughs> I, I, give me a couple days. Um, no, so anyway, I think this is a very large charge that I was given, um, and I'm not sure I can do it justice, but here we go. So this is an outline of what I'm going to try to cover. Um, and I thought I would make this a uh, time for reflection um, and reflect on what OTS and my own sort of scientific upbringing in Costa Rica has meant to me. So there will be a lot of personal journey sprinkled in with a much more sort of um, kind of broad, broad stroke tried, uh, snapshot vision of, of tropical biology. Um, and so then I want to go on a little bit of history. So let's think about some of the past of tropical biology. Um, and this hopefully will get to a very, very brief overview of Costa Rica's strong and evolving role in tropical biology. And then I was asked to give some forecasting of the role of, tro of, role of tropical biology or co uh, the role of Costa Rican tropical biology. Let's see, let's see how far I get. Um, and I realize it's getting very late in the day. That's true. If you stick with me and you're still awake at the end of my talk, I will read you a bedtime story. <laughs> so that's the outline of what I wanted to talk about. Um, like many gringos who wind up in tropical biology, my own story in tropical biology started when I crossed this bridge. Of course we all recognize this bridge. Um, in 1994, I, I realized too, Kyle, so cleverly st uh, staged this from career stages. I guess I'm now representing the, <laughs> the older side of <laughs> tropical biology. Thanks, Kyle. Anyway, so in 1994, I crossed this bridge when I took um, a three-week OTS short course with Mo Donnelly, the incomparable Mo Donnelly. Um, as, um, as an instructor. And my experiences at La Selva are really what made me tropical. So what made me tropical was everything I came to learn from there. Um, so after taking this short course, um, I returned to La Selva to work as an intern in the GIS lab. Um, after working in the GIS lab, I came back to La Selva to do my dissertation studies. Um, and my dissertation studies were concerning the, um, or exploring the consequences of land use change on soil car carbon storage in Sarapiqui. So again, my experiences at La Selva were really what made me tropical. After graduating from, um, uh, with my PhD, and I won't even say when, <laughs> Um, because it was last century. <laughs> anyway, um, after graduating with my PhD, I had the immense good fortune to be part of an OTS course um, that had the unfortunate name of Advanced Comparative Neotropical Ecology, or ACNE, for short. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that name or that acronym, but luckily um, we became known as the Four Foresters. This course became known as the Four Forest Course. Um, and this was, in every single way you could imagine it, it was the dream course. We spent 10 weeks together and we visited four uh, tropical field stations. And in a very way, in a very real way, my experiences on the Four Forest Course are what made me into a biologist. So what we did during this course was to go to all of these amazing places, to La Selva, BCI, Cochacashu, and Kilometer 41 in Brazil, again, an, another strange name for, for a field station, and we all collected data sets. We collected the same data set 
at each one of these field stations. So at the end of our two month experience, we had a comparative data set. We had a geographically comparative data set. What I did when given the opportunity to visit these completely amazing field stations was proposed to, was proposing to spend all of my time um, digging in the soil and collecting roots. So that's what I did. I went to the most amazing places on earth and I spent all my time digging holes. Um, Kyle well knows this. Um, so I dug lots and lots of holes. I dug them everywhere. And then I spent a lot of time washing roots. So I was not going to include any soil data at all um, in this talk, but I met a wonderful person on the taxi coming in from the airport, and she begged me to include some soil data. So Julie, this is for you. <laughs> anyway, this is one of the figures that came out of the study that I, um, I did on, on, my, on, the, on the Four Forest course. Um, I spent 10 weeks digging holes, measuring roots, um, and we could summarize everything I learned in one figure. Um, here, roots of course are fine roots. I was measuring fine roots by depth in the soil. Fine roots are used by plants to extract water from the soil and to extract nutrients from the soil. Um, what I've plotted here are the values of fine root length density for the four forests we visited, and I'm plotting them as a function of total soil nitrogen as one index of soil fertility. And what you can see here from this snapshot in these rainforests is that there is a negative correlation between uh, fine root length density and one measure of soil fertility. And this holds both within sites and across sites. And the explanation for this is that trees growing on high fertility soils do not need to invest a lot of fine root mass um, in gathering um, nutrients because they have plentiful nutrients. Um, by contrast, um, trees growing on low fertility soils presumably invest more fine roots in, um, invest more biomass in fine roots to gather scarce um, nutrients. So this is an example of the geographically comparative approach to biology that I learned through my experiences in the OTS course, and this has really become the foundation of my career. In so many ways, my experiences in the Four Forest course launched me as a biologist. Um, I was able to turn this two-month um, field course into three papers. Um, but more than that, uh, more than sort of my, my, my scientific output from this course, what I really learned was how, by digging thousands and thousands of holes across all these different places, I learned how different tropical rainforests are. I learned what, what unites them and what differentiates them. And this really has informed my career since then. Um, as a further example of work that we did, a number of us from this course wanted to keep working together. And so we came up with the idea of it, inviting some colleagues to work with us to do a standardized litter decomposition uh, experiment everywhere we could find friends. Um, and so this was the first um, global litter decomposition study, or I guess pantropical litter decomposition study, where we had uh, friends in 13 countries, 23 forests, and we all did a standardized protocol to understand the uh, leaf litter decomposition rates in relation to environmental variables. And that was work that I did as a postdoc. Um, when I finally got a faculty job, again, many moons ago, um, I came back to Costa Rica and I wanted to grow roots uh, in the tropical dry forest biome. And so that's basically where I've been working ever since. Um, and I tell people, you know, when you fall in love with the tropical dry forest, you can't fall out of love. You have to keep working there the rest of your career, and that's what I've done. Um, and so, shout out to Mahmoud. Um, we spend, in my group, we spend a lot of time working in Palo Verde, but um, we are based in Área de Conservación Guanacaste. Um, my research group is really embedded within um, uh, ACG, um, and we work very closely, so this is a shout out to Andrea, we have the great privilege of working closely with the staff of the Horizontes Forestry uh, and Restoration Station um, to really do um, collaborative research there. 
The goals of my lab are to understand the patterns and mechanisms through which seasonally dry tropical forests respond to changes in land use and climate. And we do this from microbial to biome wide scales. Um, and we use a number of different tools or lenses through which we look at these processes, including community assembly, functional ecology, and ecosystems ecology. Again, soils. Um, another picture for Julie. Um, this is an example of what makes Costa Rica and what makes um, uh, the little corner of the world, nor northwestern Costa Rica, a wonderful place to work. Um, there is an enormous diversity of soil gradients there that you can see in these uh, measurements of soil texture. This is just one example of some of the projects we've done in my lab. Um, we have forest inventory data where we've put in forest plots across gradients of succession and gradients of edaphic variables or soil, uh, soil variables. And then we've looked, we've identified all the tree species in those plots and we've used these data to try to understand um, the extent to which variation in soil properties are correlated with species abundances. Um, so this is a study one of my students, Leland Worden, did where he took the uh, information we had on the abundances of different tree species across these soil gradients and he modeled 82 species across um, either soil fertility, soil texture, or successional gradients. Um, and this is a great example of a species that is a very strong, um, uh, is, has preferential distributions on very, very nutrient poor soils. So this is Quercus oleoides. Um, you can see here the probability of occurrence drops off dramatically as soil fertility increases. So these are just snapshots of some of the projects my lab has been involved in. What I do, or <laughs> what I do now, um, in contrast to this sort of plush, wonderful uh, field station that I could rely on when I was doing my dissertation work, I now manage my own field station um, in ACG. This is it. <laughs> it's, it's like glorified camping. Um, and we call it Cafe Baghdad. Um, but my experiences at OTS have taught me the value of having field stations. And again, this is a shout out to Roberto Cordero. Um, many of the students who work with me have come, they, they were undergraduates in Costa Rica and they spend three months to three years working in our lab. And I, in many, and many of them were trained by Roberto, so I feel like I owe my career to him in many ways. Um, some of these wonderful students came through his lab and now they are, um, uh, in graduate school and some of them are working with me. And this is an example of Herman Vargas and some work he's doing now. And work he's doing is really informed by my experiences in OTS. Um, he's been visiting four different forests. For some reason, that, that, that's the right number for me, is four forests. Um, we've been trying to understand the variation in, uh, in plant community function and structure across neotropical dry forests. And so Herman visited Colombia, Costa Rica, uh, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. And in each one of these places, he's been collecting plant hydraulic traits. Um, so this is a figure that shows um, a number of different species, the dominant species at each site, and leaf turgor loss point. So the wilting point of leaves. Um, and what you can see here is large variation within these sites, but you can also see variation among these sites. And this variation, the mean variation in hydraulic traits is correlated to aspects of, um, of rainfall regime. Not incidentally, Herman Vargas's first paper that he authored as a first author came out of work he did as an REU student at La Selva. So that's a little bit of my personal history, how it is I got to be here in front of you today. So now I want to move on to thinking about this broader question of the role of um, OTS, in particular in Costa Rica in general, in facilitating tropical biology. And I titled this as, um, this was the title of my talk, but really, it, for me, this is a hypothesis. It's a question. Um, the past, present, and future essentialness of Costa Rica to tropical biology, what evidence do we have? So I really think of this question, you know, does OTS 
OTSs Costa Rica serve as a net for tropical biology and for tropical biologists. So I think we could argue this a number of different ways. You know, who among us does not have a dog-eared copy of this book somewhere, Growing Mold, um, that's been looked at so many different times? Um, you know, countless dissertations, thesis proposals, projects have been inspired by what is part of this book. But I wanted to take a little bit more quantitative approach to answering this question. Um, and so I thought what I would do is look through some of the pages of Biotropica. Um, there are fabulous other journals that deal with tropical ecology, Revista de Biología Tropical, which predates Biotropica, but I am the incoming editor-in-chief of Biotropica, so I wanted to get to know Biotropica a little bit better to test this sort of out of Costa Rica hypothesis. So my hypothesis was that over time, the number of studies published in Biotropica would increase, um, but, and I've sort of exaggerated these colors um, to make the point, but that we would see a large proportion of these studies being based in Costa Rica, and eventually um, the relative proportion of studies from Costa Rica might decrease over time as OTS trained biologists sort of go out into the world beyond Costa Rica and start looking at things. So I collected just a snapshot of data because in all honesty, I've, I've, I have a lot of other things to do, but this was really fun. Um, <laughs> what I did was to go through one year of all of the research papers published in Biotropica for, from when the journal started, 1969, um, all the way to 2009, and I looked at all the research papers and I scored where the research was conducted, so the country where the research was conducted. Um, this does not address the very interesting question of the institutional affiliations of authors. Um, Gabriela Stocks has a really interesting paper on that. Um, but this, I would argue, this sort of mid-80s bulge in the relative proportions of papers coming out um, of Costa Rica is consistent with my uh, out of OTS, out of Costa Rica hypothesis. And not, I feel like in many ways, um, Andrea said everything I wanted to say, but more articulately. Um, this is a, um, a paragraph from that recent paper that um, Dan Jansen and Winnie Hallwax published, and I just want to highlight the very first few sentences. This is Dan Jansen speaking. I arrived in Costa Rica in 1963 to be part of Jay Savage's tropical biology course taught by the incipient Organization for Tropical Studies. I met a small tropical country the size of West Virginia that was half covered with old growth forests and literally crawling, walking, and flying away with unbelievable numbers of species and individual insects. So Dan also is uh, a testament, I think, to the sort of the, the importance of OTS as a net um, from which tropical biologists <laughs> have, have flown, I guess. Um, and this, this, this goes on. Of course, we've talked a lot about the courses and the value of the courses of OTS. Um, this is my graduate student, Laura Toro, um, who's from Colombia, and she took the foundations course last summer. Um, she'll be doing her dissertation work in Guanacaste um, and in Colombia. Okay, so I wanted to focus or pivot just a little bit to this question of, you know, how is Costa Rica's role in tropical biology changing. And to me, of course, the core of OTS is the field stations and the courses. And I wanted to understand just a little bit how has this role changed through time or has this role changed through time? Um, what and, and the way I framed this question to myself was, what is the value of ecological field stations? I've already sort of touched on the value of OTS courses for launching the careers of many tropical biologists, myself included. Um, but what is the value of these field stations? Um, if you're interested in the history of, um, of uh, US-run field stations in 
the tropics, in the, uh, in the neotropics in Central and South America. I would encourage you to read this book, uh, which recently came out, that gives a very unsparing view of this, of this history, which I think is really fascinating. Um, but it also h highlights some of the value of field stations, what we get from field stations place-based research. You know, what is the importance of that? Well, place-based research leads to the accrual of long-term observations. It allows researchers to do large-scale manipulative experiments. You know, would you set up your fertilization experiment in a forest that you thought would be harvested in two years? No, it's the security um, of knowing, of having that security that you can come back year after year after year and these large scale experiments will be there. And over time, I think the value of field stations is the knowledge that accumulates. You know, every, um, every field problem report, every master's thesis, every dissertation you can throw on the pile accumulates and that knowledge then feeds into itself in spurring research. And again, Andrea, I think, stole a lot of my thunder because we were thinking the same way. Um, what I did was a search, a web of science search, just like Andrea, uh, but I looked for um, uh, publications that had come out of La Selva. So I searched on the terms La Selva and Costa Rica, and I it returned over 400 papers that have been published since 1989. Um, and I think that this distribution of topics, um, ecology, plant sciences, environmental sciences, entomology, biology, this gave me reassurance. You know, my hypothesis would have been that organismal research over time would be replaced by things like, you know, remote sensing analysis of forest biomass, but I think Carlos' talk um, has disproved that already. Um, that there is a very vibrant role for understanding organismal biology, and this can coexist with the types of things I do, which are to um, cut down trees and measure the carbon. And again, this just highlights some of the value of field stations. They allow, you know, where else could you think of papers come out, you know, three decades of annual growth, mortality, physical condition, and microsite for 10 tropical rainforest species. You know, 35 years of data on reptile decline. These, these types of studies are made possible through field stations. So I want to argue here um, on, on, on very little data, very little evidence, I guess I would say, but I'll argue passionately anyway, that the role of Costa Rica and the role of field stations in Costa Rica um, as a natural history, um, as sites for natural history investigations, as sites for ecosystems ecology and other types of investigations um, is not diminished, that these two types of science coexist. Um, and as an example of that, this is a large scale through fall exclusion experiment or drought experiment that my lab is currently um, doing in, um, in Horizontes, Costa Rica, where we put up the first large scale um, drought experiment in the dry tropics to try to understand how tropical dry forest responds to reduced precipitation. So I definitely think this type of ecology is as relevant and vibrant as this newer kind of ecology. So, ruminations on the future, the future of tropical biology. Well, unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, and I think that, you know, the sort of halcyon days where I was in grad school, where I was working at La Selva, you know, in many ways, the, the challenges facing OTS are different now. And I think these may be persistent. And they include attracting students and researchers. Putting these experiences in, within the reach of a greater diversity of people, including people in Costa Rica. Uh, so I think it's really wonderful that this event today is hosted here at Universidad de Costa Rica. And last, and I think, uh, again, our Andrea really um, spoke to this need very articulately, this need to connect the science that we do um, in field stations in other places 
with the environmental policy, um, with the management, um, with restoration, with conservation. Um, we, as scientists, need to be very outgoing um, and, and um, ask for and maintain a seat at the table as society is facing these very large challenges that we've heard about today. Um, amphibian decline, global warming, um, uh, collapse of entire groups of organisms. We need to be there at the table. And last, um, as I mentioned, as, as I promised, if you guys stuck with me, I would read you a bedtime story. We've come to the bedtime story part of the talk. Um, and to me, th so this is, uh, this is a, a story that I wrote um, mostly 25 years ago when I was working at La Selva. To me, this is my La Selva story. Night and day in the rainforest. The sun was setting on a rainforest in Costa Rica. Parrots were squawking as they flew home to sleep for the night. A young Kawadi named Pizotito was not sleepy, as he explained to his mother. Kawadi sleep at night in the trees. After his family was asleep, Pizotito climbed down the tree to explore the forest. He was surprised to meet an animal he had never seen before. Her name was Paquita, and she was a paca. Pacas are nocturnal. They sleep during the day and are awake at night. Paquita took Pizotito to meet some of her friends in the frog swamp. They silently watched the jaguar from behind the tree. Day was breaking in the rainforest. Some animals, like the kinkajou, were getting ready to sleep, and some, like the tinamou and the anteater, were just getting up. Pizotito brought Paquito home to meet his mother. She suggested that Pizotito introduce Paquita to some of his friends. Pizotito's friends were diurnal animals. They were awake during the day, like the turtle warming herself in the sun by the riverbank. When the sun was high in the sky, they met a troop of spider monkeys and an eyelash viper. As day was turning into night, they said goodbye. They both thought about how the forest is full of interesting animals all day and all night long. And then I want to end with the shot. I don't know if you guys can see, but what we are doing here, this is me, Helena Muller-Landau, Rebecca Montgomery, and Pierre-Michel Forget. We are on top of a, um, they, don't call it a, they don't call them tapuis, I guess, in French Guiana. Um, we're on top of this thing in French Guiana looking out. So anyway, um, with that, I wanted to thank you guys for the opportunity to, um, to let me talk about these things. And, um, and I want to encourage you guys to keep going. <laughs> um, so, muchas gracias. Thank you.